we're ready to study. Let's pray. Father in heaven, please guide our minds as we open your word so that we will rightly divide your word of truth. I ask in Jesus' name, amen. All right, you see on the outline, we're going to talk about sin. Why should we talk about such a negative subject? Sin. We want to know about victory over sin. What is sin? It's a little bit like going to a doctor's office. When you go to the doctor, you go because something isn't quite the way it should be, but you don't know quite what's wrong. And you know what the most important thing that that doctor can do for you? Is to give you a correct diagnosis. If the diagnosis is wrong, forget about the remedy. You're going nowhere. But diagnosis gives you options for treatment. Correct diagnosis. And it's precisely like that with the gospel. I'm going to suggest that the decision you make about this little subject this afternoon, this question, what is sin, is the most important religious decision you will ever make in your life. Because two different gospels are built on two different answers to the question, what is sin? What is sin? All right, you see in your outline, there are two definitions of sin. Definition A, original sin, that's the theological term. Subtitled, sin as nature. What does that mean precisely? We are sinners, not because we say or do or think wrong things. We are sinners because we have inherited bad equipment. We have within, our, within us a fallen nature and stand condemned before God because we have that fallen nature. Even if we choose to say no to that fallen nature, we are still sinners because we have that nature. That is the orthodox definition of sin throughout the Christian world. That is what most Christians believe sin to be. We are born sinners is the mantra that accompanies that. Sin is the way we are by our very nature. That's definition A. Definition B. Oh, by the way, let's, uh, before I do that, let me share with you two statements from those who believe in definition A. Sinful man is not lost because he has committed sins, but because he is born of Adam and therefore already stands condemned in him even before he commits sins of his own. Why are we lost? Not because we sin, but because Adam sinned. And we are Adam's children, and therefore stand under his condemnation. Another person says it this way, because, uh, we, we make sinful choices because we are already sinners by nature. Why do we lose our temper? Because we're already a sinner, and that's just one more expression of it. We lose our temper because we're already a sinner. All right, that's definition A. Definition B, sin as choice. That says everything that definition A says, that we did receive a bad nature from Adam and Eve, that we do live within that nature and have to fight it constantly during our lives, that it is bad news, but it says one thing different. We are not automatically sinners because we happen to be born on the wrong planet, on the wrong side of heaven's railroad tracks. We are sinners when knowing the difference between right and wrong, we deliberately choose to do the wrong because we want to. That's definition B. Sin is a choice, the same kind of choice that Adam and Eve made. It is not an accident. It is not a state. It is a decision of the mind, a decision that we make. Now, definitely, this, uh, definition B is the minority position. Not a lot of Christians believe in definition B. And I'm going to share with you this afternoon why I take the minority position. And then I'm going to ask you to make up your own minds. Sometimes it's not always wrong to be in the minority. I found a little statement that said Noah entered the ark as a minority, but when he stepped off, he was the vast majority. <laughs> Sometimes things work out a little bit like that. All right, you've noticed I've said that there is a difference between evil and guilt. Now, what do I mean by that? Some of you have a perfect illustration of the difference between evil and guilt in your own homes. 
You may have an animal that is a very valued pet in your home. But when you examine this animal carefully, you really begin to wonder, why? Because this animal that you have in your home has a split personality. There's one side of this little pet that is warm and loving, loves to rub up against your legs, loves to go to sleep on your lap, loves your company, is a very, very affectionate little creature until you open the door to the great out of doors. And then a change takes place in your little cat. Whiskers are at full attention, tail is at full alert. Why? Because it's going out in the backyard to admire the sunset, smell the roses, or because it has something else in mind. You see, in your house there are too many rules. Its head gets all cluttered up with rules and regulations, and half of them it doesn't want to obey anyway. Outside, there are only two rules that matter. Life is very simple. Number one, you run from anything that's bigger than you, that's called survival. And number two is the fun rule, you catch anything that's smaller than you. And your cat is out there to enjoy rule number two. Strange thing happens. When your cat finds that little mouse, that little gopher that isn't quite as strong or fast as it is, catches it, does it quickly dispatch it humanely, mercifully, or does it play? with the little mouse. And then a stranger thing happens. You know, your cat has strong teeth and claws, but somehow that mouse escapes and runs off, and your cat gets to catch it all over again. Because, you see, the fun is not the eating. Its belly is full. The fun is the catching. And once again, your cat with its strong teeth and claws, that mouse escapes again, and your cat gets a third chance to catch it all over again. Now, things are not going so well for the mouse. Things are not working so well. Legs aren't functioning well. Things are not the way they were before your cat came on the scene. Now, let me ask you a simple question. Does a mouse feel pain? Does it have a backbone, nerve endings? Can it feel, suffer? Does your cat care a bit that that mouse is suffering? Does it have any compassion? Does it have any interest in the fact that another creature of God's creation is hurting? All your cat cares about is its own selfish pleasure. I don't care what someone else is thinking. I don't care what someone else is feeling. I'm going to have fun. And that's all your cat is interested in and you watch that little drama in your backyard you watch one of god's created creatures destroy another of god's created creatures limb by limb painfully slowly torturing another animal to death you watch it what do you do what do you do when your cat comes marching up to your back door, feathers sticking out of all sides of its mouth, waiting to be praised for the good job it has done in your backyard, got rid of one more of those nasty little songbirds that mess up the neighborhood. What do you do? Do you hold a little trial right on your back porch? Do you select a group of, pe of people to decide guilt or innocence? Do you have a jail cell in case the verdict is guilty? Of course, you don't do any of those things. Instead, you brush away the feathers, you scold your cat, and you welcome that little killer back into your house. <laughs> right on your back porch, you have made a distinction between evil and guilt. Right there. Does, is what your cat did, is it good or evil? It's evil, isn't it? not going to be part of God's new earth. It's evil. Do you ascribe any guilt to what your cat did? Well, why not? It did a bad thing. Because you decided that in that little brain, there is apparently no room for something we humans call conscience, which is an understanding of what is right and what is wrong because it is right, not because of the pleasure we get out of it. 
and your cat doesn't have that capability. All it's got is what we call instinct. It is a fallen nature. Your cat has a fallen nature too. Adam gave that gift to the animal world as well as to us. And all of God's creatures have this fallenness about them in which one creature, one animal, can torture another animal to death and find pleasure in it. We have the same thing happening in the human world. A baby, a toddler, finding a new plaything in a bedroom drawer. A shot rings out, a brother or sister lies dead or wounded because of the play of a two-year-old. Do we put the two-year-old on trial? Or do we talk about the parents? But what if a 17-year-old finds the same gun in the same bedroom drawer and the same results happen? Now what do we say? We want to know more. Was it accident or was it planned? What's the difference between the two-year-old and the 17-year-old? Conscience? Knowledge of right and wrong? Decision based on that? That's the difference between evil and guilt. And what we want to try to find out is, does the Bible support that difference? So would you take your Bible? You have some texts listed. We're going to go through those texts together. Genesis chapter 2, verse 17, is our first one. This is God's first command to his first created beings, and uh, it didn't seem to work out like God said it would. Genesis chapter 2, verse 17. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. And we scratch our heads. Theologians have wrestled with this text. What does that mean? Because they didn't die that day. Not for 900 more years. Why? Turn to Revelation chapter 13 and verse 8. Revelation 13, 8, the last part of that verse. And uh, I'm going to be reading it from the King James translation. Some other versions handle this verse differently. Revelation 13, verse 8, the last phrase. It speaks there of the book of life of the Lamb, and we know who the Lamb is. And then it says, the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. And we scratch our heads again because he didn't die at the foundation of the world. He died 4,000 years later. So what is going on? All right, the outline that you have in the next page has spirit of prophecy statements. Would you turn there with me? And you see the references that that are there. The first question, why was not the death penalty at once enforced in his case? That's our question. God said, in the day you eat, you die. Because a ransom was found, God's only begotten Son volunteered to take the sin of men upon himself and to make an atonement for the fallen race. So something happened in the Garden of Eden. Notice how it happened. The instant man accepted the temptations of Satan and did the very things God had said he should not do, Christ, the Son of God, stood between the living and the dead saying, let the punishment fall on me. I will stand in man's place. He shall have another chance. Are you glad for that? Do you realize that if Christ had not stepped into the garden, the human race would have gone extinct. The human race was over. Death was the end of existence. And Jesus stepped into the garden. Please notice a couple of things about this. When does Jesus step into the picture? When Adam and Eve come back to him saying, we need help, would you get us out of the mess we're in? No. He steps in even before they know they're in trouble. Our God, my friends, is a seeking God, not a waiting God. He is looking for us before we ever want to look for him. Secondly, Jesus does this on his own initiative. Please notice, he doesn't ask permission from Adam. He doesn't wait. He simply steps in immediately at the instant of their sin and says, I will take their punishment. Adam hasn't asked him to do that. I will stand in man's place. He shall have another chance. Why does Christ do that? Because a crisis exists. The human race is at stake right now. The existence of every one of us, including all the others who have ever lived on planet Earth, is at stake. And Jesus steps in to give the race a second chance. Now please notice one more thing. 
He isn't doing it just for us who sit in these church pews today. He has done it for every person who has ever lived, including those who have never heard his name and those who hate his name. He has provided that opportunity for them as well, giving them the breath of life and a chance for eternal life. Jesus did that in the garden that day. Please notice the next paragraph. As soon as there was sin, there was a Savior. doesn't say even forgiveness or even repentance it says that there was a savior at the moment of sin to take care of something important right then and what was that the existence of humanity the race was at stake right then in a nutshell that's why i don't believe in definition a definition a says that in spite of what jesus did in the garden In spite of what he did on the cross of Calvary 4,000 years later, I am still paying for Adam's sin. I am still condemned. Remember the statement we just read. I am condemned because Adam sinned. Well, when Jesus pays for something, my friends, is it paid for? Or do I have to pay a little extra just to be sure? And I believe Jesus paid for Adam's sin that day in the garden. Now, could Adam and Eve still have been lost after that time? Of course they could. Look at the story of Cain and Abel. God said very simply, to help you understand how serious this problem is, that you are really uh, in, in, in bigger trouble than you ever imagined, and the magnitude of the sacrifice that's going to take place, I'm going to ask you to do something that you don't want to do. I'm going to ask you to find a lamb that has never hurt you in the world. I'm going to ask you to take its own life with a knife, and watch the blood drip out as a way of understanding how big the price is that's going to be paid for your eternal life. What did Abel say to that? I'll do it. If God says it, that's right. What did Cain say? Not my fault. I didn't do it. It was my parents' fault. I don't raise animals. I'm a gardener. I'll just find something in the garden I can bring, and that's my contribution. What did Cain do? He rejected the remedy. Abel accepted the remedy. Cain rejected it. That's the way Adam and Eve or any human being can be lost by rejecting the remedy. The remedy is there. We have to reject it. In fact, I would put it this way. Definition A, what most Christians believe in, believe that believes that a baby is born on a slippery slope into hell, sliding into hell from the very moment of birth. And of course, that's why many churches practice infant baptism from the Catholic Church into the Protestant churches because that baby is guilty and going to hell. I believe that every baby born into this world is born in some important way facing the cross of Jesus Christ that that baby is alive because of what Jesus did on the cross of Calvary and in the Garden of Eden. And the only way that baby will end up in hell is by trampling over the cross to get there. I think God is trying to make it hard to go to hell. I think he's putting every barrier in the way so that we don't make that tragic choice. And he's putting the cross right there, straight in front of our eyes, And we have to trample it into the mud before we become condemned lost sinners in the sight of God. Let's see what else we can find. Turn with me to John chapter 9. I'll not be reading all of the texts. You can read them on your own. John chapter 9, in which Jesus and his disciples are walking along the road, and they find a man who was blind. Now this man happened to be blind from his birth. And that makes his, gives his disciples a chance to ask a question that apparently had been bothering them. Look at verse 2, John chapter 9, verse 2. And his disciples asked him, saying, Master, who did sin, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Please notice their question. It is not, is this man a sinner? No, that's obvious. Look at his eyes. Of course he's a sinner. What we want to know is because he was born that way, how does that work, Lord? Did his parents do something very bad and he's being punished for their sin? Or did he do something wrong in his mother's womb and thus is suffering for his own sin? That's what their question is. And look at Jesus' answer. Neither hath this man sinned nor his parents. Jesus says, you've got it all wrong. Your premise is wrong. You're assuming that because he is blind, he is a sinner. 
And Jesus is saying, don't confuse blindness with sin. Now, blindness is evil, yes, but blindness carries no guilt. Not because of his parents, not because he sinned before he was born. And then he says, but that the works of God should be made manifest in him. Right now, the works of Satan were being made manifest in the man. Blindness is a result of Satan's rule of this planet. And if he had his way, every one of us would be born blind. Now, how does Jesus take care of this man's problem? Does he hold out his hand and say, I forgive your blindness? His blindness doesn't need forgiving. What does it need? Healing. And isn't that what Jesus does for the man's eyes? He heals the evil that Satan has done. He doesn't need to forgive what the results of sin were. He only needs to forgive the guilt of sin. Turn back to John 5. John 5, verse 24, where Jesus says something that seems to be contradictory. John 5, 24. Verily, meaning truthfully, I say unto you, he that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. According to Jesus, when can you have everlasting life? Sometime in the future? Or can you have it right now, today? If you believe in Jesus Christ as your Savior, then look what he says in the next verse. Verily, verily, I say unto you, the hour is coming and now is when the dead, the dead, shall hear the voice of the Son of God, and they that hear shall live. How can you have everlasting life and be dead at the same time? Doesn't Jesus hopelessly contradict himself here? Or did something happen that day when Jesus stepped into the garden? Did he separate death into two parts right there in the Garden of Eden? And did he not say that everyone, good or evil, will have to die a first death, which he later called sleep, as a result of Adam's sin, having nothing to do with their guilt, but having to do with the evil that was brought into the world by Adam? But Jesus said, be very careful that you don't die the second death. Fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. So there are two deaths. Don't we see those two right here? Jesus says you can have everlasting life right now if you believe. You might die for a while. That's irrelevant. Because God is holding your life in his hands. You have everlasting life. So I'd like to try to um, put on the screen here something that might be of some help here. Sin. The sin that Adam and Eve brought into the world has two phases, two parts. It has evil and it has guilt. Now, they have two different results. They lead to two different places. The evil that Adam and Eve brought into the world lead to death which is the result of Adam's sin. The guilt leads to hell, which is the penalty for that sin. Evil results, guilt, final destruction. And so there you have two different results of the same sin that Adam brought into the world. And again, most Christians do not understand that there is a difference between those two concepts, and they squash them all together and say, see, the baby is born with an evil nature. That means it's going to hell. That's why we have to baptize that baby. But what does the baby's evil nature need? Healing? Sure. Recreation? Sure. Forgiveness? No. God simply forgives. When he forgives our guilt, what else has gone out of our future? There's no hell in your future. You have everlasting life. Does evil disappear at the same time that guilt disappears? When is God going to take care of that? At the second coming. And then there's no more death. Then there's no more pain. Then there's no more suffering. Guilt needs forgiveness. Evil needs recreation. And if we confuse that, we completely misunderstand the gospel and the way of salvation. All right, let's try another text. 
This time we're skipping down to section C in John chapter 9, verse 41. John chapter 9, verse 41. Jesus is here speaking to the Pharisees. And he says to the Pharisees, If ye were blind, he means ignorant, did not know, ye should have no sin. But now ye say, we see, we know what's going on, therefore your sin remaineth. What is Jesus tying sin to right here? Isn't it light, knowledge, understanding, and a choice based on that light? turning what is evil into what is guilt, which needs forgiveness. Were the Pharisees born with the same fallen natures that we're born with? But Jesus says if you didn't know, if you had no opportunity to know, you would not have sinned. It is their knowledge and their rejection that produces their sin. Turn with me to James chapter 4 which I think is the clearest text on this point in the entire Bible. You decide for yourself. James chapter 4, verse 17. I want you to find it, so I'll give you a minute to find that. It's very important. This one doesn't need a preacher. It doesn't need a commentary. Just take a good look at it. Therefore, To him that knoweth to do good, and doeth it not, to him it is sin. To the one who knows, who understands. Does a cat know? Has no knowledge, right and wrong. Does a baby know? To the one who knows, and does not do, in harmony with that knowledge, to that one it is sin. Turn back to James 1, the clearest definition of temptation I have found in the Bible. And watch it very carefully. Most Christians, believe it or not, do not understand the difference between temptation and sin. I want you to think your way through this very carefully. James 1, 14 and 15. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. The word lust means a desire for anything out of harmony with God's will. Lust for power, lust for money, pride, etc. All kinds of human lusts. Drawn from our own natures. It says our own. His own lust and entice. In this world in which we live, temptation to be a temptation has to have two parts. Are you personally interested in trying everything you hear and see on the evening news at least once just to see what it will feel like? Are you? Or are there some things that so repulse you that you turn away from it with disgust? Like just what happened during this last week in Colorado. Is that right? Was that a temptation for you? Were you drawn by it? Were you enticed by it? Or were you repulsed by it? Well, then it wasn't a temptation for you, but obviously it was a temptation for someone. Is that correct? Or it wouldn't have been on the evening news. So, two points, two things for every temptation. Satan has many, many stimuli out there because we're all different. And he's hoping that one of those stimuli will reach home to my nature and draw from within my nature a responsive cord. I'll be drawn toward that stimulus. And that I'll be enticed by it. And that's a temptation. So it isn't a temptation if you're not drawn to it, not for you, maybe for someone else. But a temptation for you is the outward stimulus pulling a responsive cord out of your fallen nature toward that, and it can be very enticing. Now the problem is the definition A says that's sin. The Christian definition A says, you don't have to say no, you don't have to say yes. The very fact that your nature is drawn toward it, that makes you a sinner because it is evil. And that means you are sinning by the very fact that your nature is pulled toward that. Evil is sin in definition A. Temptation is sin 
in definition A, even if you say no to it. But is that what is being described in verse 14? Sin? No. Look where sin is. It's in verse 15. Then when lust it hath conceived, birth process, it bringeth forth sin. Watch the progression. Drawn of your own nature. Your nature is pulling you. Enticing. It's very attractive. That's temptation. Conceiving. Something is being born. And what is being born is sin. Definition A puts sin in steps one and two. Definition B puts sin in steps three and four. You have to decide what you believe. Because one is true and one is false. They're not just different options on the same road. Is temptation sin? That's the question. Or is the yielding to temptation sin? All right. Uh, I'm not going to take time to read Ezekiel 18. They simply, there are texts there that say the soul that sins shall die, not the father for the son, nor the son for the father. The soul that sins shall die. I'll let you read those on your own. We're going to finish up this little study this afternoon by some spirit of prophecy statements. If you will take that little page once again, and we will look halfway down the first page of the spirit of prophecy statements. Patriarchs and Prophets, page 306. Patriarchs and Prophets, 306. It is inevitable that children should suffer from the consequences of parental wrongdoing. <clears throat> But they are not punished for the parents' guilt, except as they participate in their sins. Consequences. That's evil. And we get a lot of evil consequences. Guilt? No. No guilt because our parents did something wrong, including Adam. He's one of our parents. Look at the last paragraph on this page, Gospel Workers 162. Light makes manifest and reproves the errors that were concealed in darkness. And as light comes, the, the life and character of men must change correspondingly to be in harmony with it. Sins that were once sins of ignorance because of the blindness of the mind can no more be indulged in without incurring guilt. What's a sin of ignorance? It's evil, my friends. It doesn't honor God. People 110, 150 years ago were being told that to cure uh, lung ailments, you should smoke pipes. Well, that was bad advice. And it did cost some of them their lives. But they did not commit sin. It was a sin of ignorance to which no guilt is attached until the light comes and a choice is made based on that light. That's what this is trying to say. A sin of ignorance does not carry guilt until light and a choice is made. Turn to the last page with me, page two of the Ellen White Statements. Second paragraph, Testimonies, volume five, 177. Second paragraph on page two. The sin of evil speaking begins with the cherishing of evil thoughts. Guile includes impurity in all its forms. Now here is the sentence, an impure thought, stop right there. Is it good or evil to have an impure thought? Isn't it evil? To have a thought like that cross your mind? An impure thought tolerated. Ah, is that what we're talking about here with choosing? An unholy desire cherished and the soul is contaminated. So watch very carefully again. Definition A, the standard definition says we sin when the impure thought crosses our mind because it is evil and it comes out of a fallen nature, even if we don't cherish it. The very fact that it is there is our sin. That's the majority position of sin in the Christian world. But the Bible and the spirit of prophecy don't seem to corroborate that. She says that one more thing must be done. It's called cherishing and tolerating. Remember the four steps? We are drawn, that's the impure thought, it is enticing. It is still temptation. When we cherish it, we are conceiving something new. And that is, our character is being changed. And once again, two things have to be separated or we will not understand Scripture, nature and character. 
Nature is what we are born with, our equipment, and we can do nothing about except live with it and ask God to overcome it. Character is what we do with our nature. Which gets, stays on this earth? Which ends its existence when Jesus comes? Our fallen natures. Which goes directly to heaven unchanged? Our characters. And so the first point, impure thought, refers to nature. Tolerating refers to character. Go down in the same paragraph. Halfway down the paragraph, after the second set of three dots, halfway down the paragraph, no man can be forced to transgress his own consent must be first gained. The soul must purpose the sinful act before passion can dominate over reason or iniquity triumph over conscience. Temptation, however strong, is never an excuse for sin. But the whole Christian world seemingly has turned temptation into sin. There's another statement I want to share with you that is not in your outline. This one says very simply, it's just one sentence, before sin exists in the heart, the consent of the will must be given. Before sin exists in the heart, the consent of the will must be given. And the Christian world says, no, that's false. Sin is in the mind and the heart before you ever consent to it. And so again, a decision must be made. That reference is Signs of the Times, December 18, 1893. All right, back to the outline that you have. The next paragraph is one of the clearest I have ever read. Said the angel, if light comes and that light is set aside or rejected, then comes condemnation and the frown of God. But before the light comes, there is no sin, for there is no light for them to reject. And I simply ask, could the English language be any clearer on the subject? This is not a toughie. This does not require a lot of exegesis. This does not require a Hebrew grammar. Before the light comes, there is no sin. That's why a baby isn't a sinner, a cat isn't a sinner, and that's why there will be many, many people who will keep their first Sabbath on the way to heaven. They broke God's commandment ignorantly all during their lives, never repented of it, never confessed it, because they did not have the opportunity to have light on the subject. Before the light comes, there is no sin in the sense of guilt. There is no sin that must, they must find forgiveness for. I love the next one. There are thoughts and feelings suggested and aroused by Satan that annoy even the best of men. But if they are not cherished, if they are repulsed as hateful, the soul is not contaminated with guilt and no other is defiled by their influence. Well, there's our little study on what sin is. And I ask you to think it through very carefully because once again, depending on your answer to this question, two gospels are built. If you believe, definition A, that we are sinners automatically and continue to sin automatically by our natures, even when we say no to our natures, but we are still having those evil natures within us and are still sinning, then the gospel has to be Jesus Christ bypassed all of that. He was not tempted like we are, or he would have been a sinner too. He had to have a 4,000-year skip of heredity called the Immaculate Conception. Of course, that's not the Catholic version, that's the Protestant version that Mary was born like we are, but Jesus had a 4,000-year skip of heredity. It's the same doctrine, one generation removed. That's the only way it can be done. And so you have to believe that Christ did not, was not tempted like we are. And of course then justification, forgiveness, because it becomes the only answer we have, because sanctification will always be imperfect and always lacking. It can't be a part of the salvation process. Forgiveness is what righteousness by faith is all about. And God has to wait until the second coming to make us like him in character. But if you believe definition B, that sin is choice, then Jesus can come down to our level, actually be tempted in all points like as we are, as the Bible seems to indicate, and resist that sin by the power of the Holy Spirit showing us that we can be forgiven and can resist the power of sin by the same Holy Spirit that he used during his entire life on earth. And if we allow him to, he will make us like him in character before he comes back. Two different definitions, two different gospels. 
This is the major de decision of your life, my friends. You'll have to decide. The Gospels can't be combined. That's just like combining creation and evolution, which most Christians are trying to do these days. Have you noticed? We believe in creation, but this is the way it happened over millions of years, the, fang, the tooth and claw. And those two systems are totally opposite, yet most Christians are trying to put them together. These two Gospels are totally opposite, yet many Christians and many Adventists are trying to put them together, and it can't be done. You can believe one or the other. You cannot believe parts of both. And so, my friends, uh, I think the decision is a very important decision. 